Welcome to Drama Free Healthy Living with Jess Cording. I'm your host, Jess Cording. I'm a registered dietitian, health coach, and author, and I'm here to help you streamline your wellness routine and establish a sane, more balanced relationship with food and fitness so you can reach your goals without losing your mind. On this podcast, we'll talk about nutrition, exercise, self care, mindset, and more. I'll be bringing you interviews and expert insight on the topics that matter to your health and wellness. Hi, and welcome back to the Drama Free Healthy Living Podcast. I'm your host, Jess Cording. I'm so excited that you are joining me today. We are, uh, you know, no one comes to this podcast for small talk, so I have none to offer in today's episode. Um, I am chatting with Dr. Sean Tasson, who also goes by America's Holistic Gynecologist. So Dr. Tassone is the first physician in the U.S. to actually be double board certified in obstetrics and gynecology by the American Board of Integrative Medicine. So he holds a medical degree in addition to a Ph.D. in mind-body medicine, and he practices in the Austin, Texas area. He is a hormonal expert, author, speaker, highly rated patient advocate, creator of a the world's first integrative hormonal mapping system and host of the Confessions of a Male Gynecologist podcast. So in his 20 plus years of practice, he's listened to over 50,000 women's stories and is determined to remove the myths surrounding women's health. So we do talk quite a bit in this episode about medical gaslighting as it relates to women's health. Additionally, as an integrative health practitioner, he believes that you should have an active role in your care. And we talk a lot about how to advocate for yourself, questions to ask your provider. And his work includes studies and publications on hormonal imbalances, spirituality in medical care, whole foods to heal the body, and integrative medicine. Dr. Tassone is featured in many, many publications, including New York Times, NBC News, uh, Stanford MedEx, just to name a few. And his latest book, The Hormone Balance Bible, published by HarperCollins in 2021, is available worldwide. So we get into a lot of different topics today related to healthcare, we talk about medical gaslighting, we talk about how to navigate the wild world of the supplement industry, lots, lots to learn in today's podcast episode. So without further ado, let's get to it. Sean, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Yeah, it's nice to be recording again. And I, I always enjoy, you know, your, your insights, you know, and I, I love asking my, my healthcare providers, my founders on, on this podcast, you know, I like, I love a good origin story. And I would love to hear what inspired you to study medicine and eventually become a gynecologist. Oh, it's funny because in the last couple of weeks, I think I've had a bit of a chip on my shoulder because I've been getting a little bit of blowback about being a man, obviously, in this profession. And I think it's a legitimate question, obviously. Uh, you know, back when I did residency, which was 94 to 98, the number of men and women in residency was about half and half. So it was starting to make that transition to more females. I think right now women are 75% of the OBGYNs and in private practice. There's a superficial answer and there's a deeper answer. The superficial answer would be, you know, when you're a fourth year medical student, you make all these, you make your schedule kind of like with what you thought you want to do. And I thought initially that I wanted to go into internal medicine and maybe do cardiology or gastroenterology or something like that. And I took an elective and the elective was an ultrasound. I was, I just thought, you know, hey, it's going to be easy, whatever, you know, I'll do this. And I found out that I really liked the ultrasound part. And what I did was I did the OB uh, GYN ultrasound department. And I noticed that a lot of the residents that were in that profession were very similar to my personality. Like I got along with them great. And the internists, each profession has its own personality. I just felt like I fit in better. There were, you know, it was mostly happy, you know, you're dealing with babies and everybody was happy and young and healthy for the most part. And so I started looking at that a little bit more and it just made more sense to me to to go into that profession. Fast forward years and years later, I was doing mind-body medicine training with um, the Center for Mind-Body Medicine in California. And They make you do this uh, genogram chart where, you know, it's circles and squares and it's you and then your parents and then your grandparents. And instead of doing genetics, we were doing it based on relationships. So good relationships were a blue line, conflicted relationships were a red line. And I put this big piece of paper up on the wall and we were kind of interpreting each other's charts. And the lady that I was with said, 
do you notice that all of your maternal lines in your family are conflicted? Like every single one of them, me and my mom, my mom and her mom, my dad and his mom and my kids and their mom. And it was like, when I saw it, I was like, well, maybe on some weird familial, spiritual, otherworldly level, I kind of went into this to try and maybe fix this maternal bond issue for my own family and for my generations to come. I mean, it sounds a little bit deep, but when I saw it, it was kind of like one of those like aha moments kind of, you know, so that may be a little deeper of, a, of an answer. But overall, OBGYN, if you look at those doctors, family practice, peds and OBs, they tend to be people you'd probably want to hang out with, have fun. You know, they're normally pretty jovial because it's a jovial profession and, you know, it's happy. It's not like oncology where you have to be serious all the time. And I, there's no way I would ever have been an oncologist. Thank God they're out there, but I couldn't have handled that. I appreciate you sharing that. And this is on this podcast. We don't do small talk. So yeah. I appreciate the deep answer. Thank and I, I can actually relate to that. I am, um, you know, my family, terrible relationships with food, so much illness. And I got to this point pretty, pretty young where I was like, you know what? I want this shit to stop with me. We're going to, we're going to fix this. You, you know? know, in my book, The Hormone Balance Bible, I use archetypes. And I think one of the archetypes that I like to talk about is the wounded healer. And I think that a lot of doctors go into their chosen professions based on their wounds, whether they know it or not. Like a pretty easy one. I've had two friends. One had a seizure disorder as a kid that went into neurology and the other who was a childhood diabetic who went into endocrinology. So you can see kind of that obvious. But then there's other people like me who maybe didn't know that was one of your wounds, but I think you're always trying to heal those archetypal wounds. And that's, for me, that's probably one of the reasons I went into, I just didn't realize it at the time. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you sharing that because I think there's a lot of people who can relate. And I, I remember being, uh, when I was, I don't know, 18, 19, something that I got my astrological chart done and I can you know, take that with a grain of salt. But I remember being told that I had in the career sector of my chart, I had Chiron, the wounded healer. And at the time I was a writing major. I was like very much in like trauma response land of just like acting out and like, you know, just doing, you know, having a college experience. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then all these years later, you know, found myself working as a dietitian who specializes in, you know, mind, body and mental health. I'm like, oh, okay, yes, I I see that now. And I appreciate you also talking about the, you, you said, I think the word blowback for being a male in mm-hmm. the space. And sometimes, yeah. So would, you know, I'd love to hear what that's been like for you. Cause to, if this makes you feel any better, the, the worst gynecologist I ever had was a female. So just to feel, you know, just FYI, there it doesn't, doesn't have to be, you don't, it, you don't have to be a woman. It's an interesting place to be in because I understand the sexism that is in the patriarchy that's in medicine. And, but in my particular profession right now, it is about 75% women. And I remember when I came out of residency and I was looking for a job, I came out of the military because I had a payback in 2002 and I could not find a job because everyone was hiring women. And you have to be sensitive to that because it's the market and women want female providers. And I understand that. What I found was that for obstetrical care, women wanted women. And for gynecologic care, most women don't care. They're, um, they just want the best person that's got the best bedside manner. For OB, they want a woman because they feel like obviously there's some empathy there. But a lot of the women that I know didn't have babies. And I've heard actually female providers say things like, oh, she thinks she has bad periods. I have bad periods and I'm still working. And so it can kind of go the other way too. that that sympathetic response can actually be kind of like the way that they judge you. I, somebody tells me it hurts. I'm like, uh, yeah, I can't even imagine I wouldn't wouldn't want to have that pain myself. But it's a very sensitive topic because I get it. I know that there is so much patriarchy and sexism in the workplace in general that I'm not going to sit and complain about it. But some women, it, it's kind of odd to have some patients not even give you a chance just because of who you are. And the women that kind of come after me, it just happened yesterday, actually. Um, she, she's a dentist and a educated woman, and yet she has that opinion. And I, I don't know. I, I guess I always thought that it was kind of a sophomoric, you know, uneducated type of response, but it's guttural, I suppose. And, 
you know, that's your choice. And the beautiful thing is women do have a choice. And I think what's funny is most women that find me, they're not, I wouldn't say desperate, but they have seen four or five other doctors and they're just not getting what they need. And really all they want is for somebody to listen to them. And that doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman. I just think that I have the ability to do that because I don't deliver babies anymore. And so I have more time. But yeah, I think it's just, it's more personality driven, I suppose. But it's a it's a sensitive topic. And sometimes it's like, you know, every once in a while it gets on your nerves, but you know, what you and I think I, I unfortunately, I think a lot of good doctors, men don't go into the profession anymore because they're worried about being able to find a job. Yeah. But to your point, so much of it is about bedside manner. I yeah. mean, like my first ever experience with a gynecologist, like I said, we don't do small talk on this podcast. I must have been like 17 or so. And uh, it was just it was time. And, you know, talk about you know, I think so much of it really comes down to, are you a good communicator? Can yeah. you make people at ease? Do you listen to them? And I remember, well, I remember, you know, as he's like down there taking a look, he's like, you know, I think you're going to be a famous author or an actress. And me being a salty teenager, I'm like, oh, so this is like bomb reading then. But I, how I were, what I really remember from that appointment was he was very shaming. Like, I remember the lecture about like I have I will always have this visual of him holding up his index finger being like, you can get the human papilloma virus from a finger like and just very like no talk about symptoms. I mean, this was like 20 something years ago. So, you know, I mean, there's that. But so much of it is really, you know, how do you communicate? Like, you know, I feel like any medical profession, but listening to your patients and talking with them. And I know not all providers, that's a whole other issue, just our medical system that providers don't have time to to sit down and really speak with people as much. But yeah, you know, and it's, I, it's, you know, I have a daughter, obviously I had a mom. You can be sympathetic, but you can also be like that provider you had where you just are an older, you know, like I'm 56 now, you're an older individual and you can treat everybody like they're your, your daughter, which, you know, that's probably what this person was doing, but you're not their daughter. And so it's, then that person probably is still the same way. It's just, you know, there's personalities are personalities and you're not going to change that. That's why women always ask me like, how do I talk to my doctor about this? They won't listen to me. I'm like, you don't, you, you, you find someone else because you're not going to change who that person is. Like, I'm not going to change who you are. It's, So you find somebody that you mesh with and it shouldn't matter what the gender is. It just should be who you feel listened to and who helps you. Absolutely. And so you mentioned that your patients tend to come to you after they've been to a few Mm -hmm. doctors and they've had a difficult time finding the the care that they they need, the support they need. You know, and you are a holistic gynecologist. Mm -hmm. So for someone who might not be familiar with that term, you know, what is what does that mean? I get that. uh, I get asked a lot about that, too. Some people will be like laugh. They'll, you know, put the emoji on there. But the way I look at it is the whole story is about, you know, my mom passed away in 2001 at the age of uh, 56 and she died of ovarian cancer. And I, I was actually a resident at the time. So I knew about the disease process, but when she, because I was doing gynecology, but when she passed away and I'm an only child, what I remember thinking was I couldn't help my own mother, like not survive, but I couldn't help her just live a happy, healthy, productive life. I felt very helpless. And I felt like, what the hell am I even doing as a doctor if I couldn't even help my own mother? You know, it's like, I felt really just, I felt that in my core. And so as you do, when you're having a spiritual crisis, you go to Sedona. And so I was in Sedona And I was reading Andrew Weil's book, uh, Eight Weeks to Optimal Health. And he was talking in 2002 or three about all these crazy things like fish oil and CoQ10. And I was like, oh, my mind was blown. But anyways, I did this fellowship that they had at the University of Arizona in integrative medicine. And integrative medicine is the holistic piece. I believe it just, to me, it just means you aren't an expert in all of these other areas like Chinese medicine or homeopathy, naturopathy, because there are experts but you have a team assembled around you that you can refer to. To me, that's the holistic part. And then in that training, there was eight weeks of spirituality in medicine, which I grew up Catholic, but it blew my mind that there was this spiritual aspect of healing. And so I did a PhD in philosophy because I guess I like to spend a lot of money on education. But for me, holistic means I'm incorporating my, I'll do robotic surgery. That's a part of holistic healing in my mind. 
But I'll also then have the knowledge base to tell a woman who's having heavy periods that she could try yarrow flour that the Native Americans have used for, you know, 800 years. So that to me is holistic. It's just tapping into all these different potential traditions. But also for me, because I'm an MD, having that surgical aspect that can help as well, because it's all part of the holistic person, you know, sometimes surgery is necessary and, but most of the time it's not. And I have that aspect too. You know, my mom is a a psychotherapist, but also a certified hypnotherapist. So Mm -hmm. I grew up, you know, being introduced to all kinds of different healing modalities. And it just, it doesn't, to my mind, I can't understand why somebody would not welcome integrating all these other practices, you know, with Western medicine. It's so, it's just, I find it fascinating that there is still sometimes this, this camp and that camp. And that, you know, there, it's like, we have to explain, like, actually, it's okay to be holistic. This is a good thing. It's not woo-woo stuff. It's ego. I think yeah. some of it. We also, when we learn medicine, it's very, it's still very Cartesian. Uh, you break the body down into separate components. And like you can see with all these professions, gastroenterology, cardiology, nephrology, there, it's an organ system that you become an expert in. And then, especially me, like, let's say I'm, I'm a hormone expert. I've done it for 25 years. And there's a coach out there that claims to be a hormone guru when this person did an eight week course in hormones. I could, my ego could get upset by that because this person is claiming a title. And I used to, I I really did. I used to get upset by that. And now it's kind of like, maybe there are women out there that aren't seeking my help because I'm an MD and they think I'm just going to blow them off. And, but this person that is a coach has, I don't know about coaching. I don't know a lot about nutrition. I know some, but not maybe the depth that they have per se. So I think we could all work together, but I do think physicians, it's a little bit of ego. It's a little bit of territory. It's a little bit of money because when you start taking away their patients, they lose income. All that kind of ties into it. And it's the ruling paradigm. I mean, like it or not, medicine, allopathic medicine is the ruling paradigm at the current time. And they don't want to let go. When you're king of the hill and other people are climbing up, you knock them back down. You don't let them, you know, take that mantle away. And so that's probably part of it too. Yeah, I appreciate you explaining that. Um, you know, and I, I was listening to what you were saying about your, your mom. I, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. I lost my dad to pancreatic cancer. Mm, right. uh, he was, he was 61 or 62. He was 62 when he passed. I was 32 at the time. And I, rem- I remember that feeling of like, what the hell? I'm a registered dietitian. Like, you know, I have all the tools to help someone who, you know, from developing and mm-hmm. with disease and, and the fact, I remember I went through a lot of soul searching where I was like, what, what am I even doing if I yeah. couldn't help my dad? And that was a game changer for me in my, not a game changer, but that was a turning point in my own journey. Cause I was like, you know, why am I hiding all these other things that I do and not embracing them? And why not actually, you know, lean into them and, you know, explore this yeah. more. Yeah. You know, and I lost my grandmother to ovarian cancer, which, mm, you know, wow. it's, it's so it's a tough, it's a tough one. And, you know, it's, um, yeah, we're not going to turn this into a therapy session, but, you know, I'm well, sorry. I've done, I, I've done a lot of that too. It's therapy is a wonderful tool. Yeah. Now, I, I, and I appreciate what you said about the hormone coaches, because to your point, you, you know, one can get really pissed off by that. And, you know, as a dietitian, I'm sure as you can imagine, like the internet is, you know, I could look at it as the tons of people stepping on my turf on social yep. media. But okay. what you said about working together it is really, really valuable. And but you, you did bring up an interesting point about the hormone, you know, hormone coach and hormones are a big thing in the media right now. And they, they have been for, for a while. But, you know, the term hormone balancing and hormone imbalance, you know, that gets thrown around yep. a lot. So, you know, for, for you as a credentialed expert, you know, for someone who's like wondering what, you know, what the hormone imbalance actually is and some signs they should be looking for, you know, what would you, what would you tell them? Well, it's kind of funny because I get attacked on both sides. So obviously my colleagues will come after me because I wrote a book called The Hormone Balance Bible and hormone imbalance, hormone balance is a, uh, is a term my colleagues don't like. They will blatant. I had to block so many of them on Instagram because they would come at me. And it's just because it's true. There is no technical medical diagnosis for this, but we do have codes in medicine for hyperestrogenism, low testosterone, 
polycystic ovarian syndrome. I mean, these are known things. So we obviously know that this thing stuff exists. We just, I'm just calling it something that they don't like. And then on the other side, I get criticized for not having the same nutritional education as, as you, which is great. I, I, I know I don't. So it's kind of hard to be in both camps. But the problem is, I think on both one side is that you have the community that I won't call them alternative because that's so de- demeaning, but the, that are outside of the ruling paradigm and they will make ter- claims like they're an expert, they're a guru, they, they're, you know, they, they know because they have this N of one where they fix their own disease process. So that makes them an expert. And they're, they're criticizing my colleagues that have 12 years of higher education. So that I think is also kind of hard to swallow at the same time. But I, I, there's a friend of mine, he's an older doctor, his name is Larry Dossie. He's written like 12 books. And he has this thing he calls the B. Stroganoff principle. And he had a friend who owned a restaurant in a small mountain town and everybody would eat there. And one day he put B. Stroganoff on the menu and Larry said he had it. It was delicious, but nobody bought it. Not one person bought it. And the guy was like, I'm going to take it off the menu. Nobody likes it. And Larry's like, it's so good though. And he's like, why don't you just call it beef with noodles? And so the guy changed it to beef with noodles and then it became like the number one seller. And it was because they were speaking the wrong language. They were speaking, everybody knew what beef and noodles was in this town, but they didn't know what beef stroganoff was. And the problem is when, when the coaches and whatnot talk to my colleagues, they use terminology that my colleagues either don't understand or they don't like, um, adrenal fatigue, stuff like that, that, that hormone imbalance. And so they'll immediately shut you down. But it, and, and that's the thing is you, because they are the ruling paradigm, if you want to work with them, you have to learn how to speak their language. They're not going to speak your language. I will tell you that right now. So it, it's, and it's an undue burden, but it's a burden. You have to learn how to speak that language because I think my colleagues will understand if you speak that language. Like when I debate another provider and I say to her, usually it's a female, okay, so you're saying hormone imbalance doesn't exist. Then why do you treat polycystic ovarian syndrome with birth control pills, which are hormones? And they, they, they can't answer me. Well, it's because it's a hormone imbalance. It's a hormonal issue, right? And they'll say, yeah, of course. And I'm like, okay, I'm using the word imbalance. What if I just said it's a hormonal issue? Okay, well, that's then, 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 then they're, you know, their butt cheeks loosen up a little bit and they're not as uh, on guard. And it's just, it's just a language thing, really, most of the time. That's, it's a, that's a very good, good example and a really good way to put that. Um, that it is just a, I, and the example of the beef stroganoff. I love that. I feel yeah. like that illustrates it so clearly. And thank you for calling out the adrenal fatigue thing. I've been, you know, I feel like in conferences, that's always a big thing. It's like, is it real? And yeah. it's like, you know, and that's I always, what my, my, my colleagues, they'll say it doesn't, it's not a real thing. I get that. I, it isn't. You're right. Because you can't code for it. But is it, and I'll, then I'll always ask, but is it possible that if your cortisol is super low all the time, like just not quite diagnosable, but just low, that that couldn't cause physical fatigue or problems? Yeah, of course. Okay. Well, what do we call it? We got to call it something. So let's call it adrenal insufficiency. I don't know, but that's, you know, it's just the, my colleagues get caught up on the terminology. And if it's not within these confines, like normal or abnormal, then they don't know what to say about it and they don't know how to treat it. Yeah, I could tell a lot of stories about that. Now, I think that, like, you know, I feel like at the end of the day, it's so much about, okay, is the patient experiencing symptoms? You know, right. What's going on with them? What might help them feel better? Like I, it's, Yes, I understand the importance of billing and coding because that's how things happen. But, you know, it's just let's about the patient, like what's their experience like. And I God, like I want to talk about medical medical gaslighting for a moment, because that is something that 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 comes up so much in in my field. And I'm sure for yours as well. But like, how are some ways like medical gaslighting? How might this show up in like a doctor's? visit. Women are told all the time, you're too young. You know, they're 40, their, their joints hurt. They are not sleeping. Oh, or they'll say something even dumber, like, well, you're so pretty. You sh- you're fine. You know, we will often tell women like you, you're, you're young, you're gorgeous. You have great hair. You couldn't be having problems. I mean, that that's gaslighting and women do it to women all the time as well. Or saying something like, the, she'll come in and she'll say, 
you know, I'm not feeling great. I got this, this, and this. I'd really like to get my labs checked. No, it's ridiculous. We don't check labs. They don't, they're not going to tell us anything. That's gaslighting. Big time gaslighting happens in emergency rooms. We know that women on average wait about 18 minutes longer to receive pain, pain medication than men because they're obviously not in pain. So that's gaslighting. I mean, anytime you have a person telling you, invalidating what you are telling them, um, whether it's, and it's usually a person in power, like the doctor and patient relationship, that you're either, you're, you're lying, you don't know what you're talking about, or they're invalidating the symptoms you have. I mean, I can't tell you, one of the more common things women, especially women over 50, are experiencing is joint pain, very, very common. Always told that it's your age. Why? Why does it have to be your age? And I put them on estrogen and their joint pain goes away. It's, it's just kind of very prevalent and it's, it's really unfortunate. But yeah, gaslighting, it's kind of come into vogue. I think maybe we use it a little too much, but, um, but it, it is prevalent in the medical system, no doubt about it. You know, do you, I'm just laughing. I'm thinking of when my dad was sick, I was so checked out of taking care of myself because I was so focused on taking him. Like, is he going to get to chemo on time? Like, is he going to have what he needs? And I remember I ended up having a, um, I jokingly call it like a slow burn of a near-death experience, which is just a, I, I went to the urgent care with, a, I was having like a crazy like rash outbreak. I was on, and I didn't put it together that it was an antibiotic I was on for a mm. fingernail thing. And I, because I didn't have any known drug allergies and they were like, oh, maybe it's syphilis. Like That was like, but it was like. Wow, that's a jump. Yeah. That is and a I, huge jump. They sent me home with a, a script for eczema cream. And in the middle of the night, my whole, my throat started to swell, my whole body. I got, I ended up getting like an emergency, like Benadryl shot. Like it, it was wild. And I think because I was like trying to gaslight myself too, because I was so used to being like, you know, um, I mean, you know, not to make a scene, not to push. And that was a big learning experience for me. I, I got very lucky that um, I didn't, get even worse than it than it did but um wow that was that was an eye opener i've no i mean what's funny i've maybe seen syphilis twice in 25 years and it was both of them were in obstetrical patients because we checked for it but that's just to go to syphilis like it's just that i've never heard that one before that's good that's yeah that was new york city so maybe the maybe the bar is set in a different they, maybe they have yeah maybe they see a lot more of that there right. that's possible yeah but um but even then it's still a huge jump oh my god but, you know, is there anything that you would recommend in terms of how um, women can advocate for themselves? Obviously, much better than I did. I think, like I said, part of this is going into it with the confidence that you want something done. If you want something done, ultrasound, labs, I, it doesn't cost me any money to order something. I mean, the only the only thing it does, I got to take the time to order it and then we get the results and I got to take a look at it. My 90% of the time, there's probably normal, whatever, and you can tell it. But for a doctor to tell a woman they don't want to order something. So if you're going in with these list of symptoms, just know that you might get pushback. If you do, I wouldn't be argumentative. I wouldn't be, I, I would be polite and I would just say, you know, that's really unfortunate um, that you're invalidating me, but I'm going to find another doctor. And I think any more with Google reviews and you can tell if somebody's bedside manner, you know, it's just like restaurants. Occasionally you're going to get a bad one. That's just the way it is. But if the overriding number of reviews are good and you see that this doctor's got a good bedside manner or whatever, then they'll probably be somebody that will work with you maybe once in a while. We all have our little quirky things we don't, you know, we'll kick back on. But as far as advocating for yourself, I know it can be frustrating but it probably doesn't do you any good to go in confrontational. I would be open-minded and have questions ready. And if you get that feeling, like I have had so many patients, even this last week, where they'll just say, you know, she's a great doctor. I really, she did a wonderful job with my babies, but this topic, she just doesn't seem to be super interested in. And so that's why I found you. If I get pregnant and I'm going to go back to her because I really like her or I'll go see her for my pap smears. But for this particular topic, I just didn't feel like I was getting what I needed. And and that's that's probably going to happen too, where doctors have areas like I do that they really enjoy and they focus on. And, and you just have to know that you're not wrong for wanting things. You're not wrong for asking for 
something that you feel is something you want. So just understand that you're fine. You, you make it kick back. And if they say no, then find somebody else that will do that. Thank you. I feel like that's a reminder people need to hear again. Because the story I have heard from my patients over the years, like yeah. serious stuff that like goes undiagnosed. And it's just like, wow. Yeah, I had a, a nurse practitioner, a patient, an educated you know, woman who's in the medical system. She was feeling miserable. And she told, she came to me because of a friend of hers who I treated for something. And she had been to the emergency room twice because she felt that bad. And they checked her and nothing, you know, they couldn't find anything wrong. So I just ran the typical hormone panel on her. And her thyroid was like out of whack. Like her not, she was overtly hyperthyroid. She had high thyroid. Her TSH was uh, super low. She obviously had hyperthyroidism. And I don't usually mess around with hyperthyroidism. So I got an ultrasound and on the ultrasound, she had this little nodule that they reported as potentially suspicious. So I sent her to the endocrinologist and the endocrinologist said to her, this is gaslighting. You look fine. She was young, pretty, you know, you look fine. Um, why don't we just give it six months and we'll repeat the ultrasound? So she called me and I was like, well, that's just ridiculous. So I sent her to another friend of mine who's a thyroid surgeon who biopsied it and it was cancer. So she had thyroid cancer. She's a nurse practitioner. She knows she doesn't feel good. And she was even being gaslit and kind of buying into it a little bit. It was her friend that made her come in. And it's just, it's not like I'm a genius. I just ordered stuff to check and then followed up on it and was a little bit persistent about it. But even educated people can get gaslit by this. It's, it's, it's pretty rampant. Yeah. It's. It's one of the things that makes me very angry when I... Yeah, that made me angry. No, but then we could look on the total opposite end of the spectrum. Maybe, the, maybe this is a whole other ball of whatever the F, but like supplements, the supplement industry, mm -hmm. especially when we talk about women's health, it is just like the Wild West. And I would love... I know we've talked about supplements before for you know different like articles, but like what do you want people to know about supplements targeted to women? Like in terms of like, What's what's like a waste of your money? Like, how do you know if something is going to be, you know, too much to too or too good to be true? Like, what do you want people to know about supplements? Women's health and hormones are a massive business. And, and celebrities are realizing this too. Gwyneth Paltrow, Holly Berry, they're now in their 50s and they are discovering that there's a lot of women suffering. And so they, uh, like Halle Berry now is a part owner of Pendulum, which has this Acromantia product and uh, one product that does metabolic control. And the problem with these supplements is that they can make any claim they want. There's nobody regulating them. They can say it increase, increases your metabolism. And if you notice, they'll say kind of things that are question, you know, like you, you're, it's like too good to be true. And I always tell patients, if it's too good to be true, it's because it is. I mean, that's just the way it is. And if you look at the supplement industry history wise, you know, look at Oz and, and all the stuff he used to promote, none of it comes true. There are good supplements out there. Um, magnesium, the maca that I like to use, uh, fish oil. The problem that I have is when they make these erroneous claims, the big thing now that I'm seeing is topical uh, estriol creams for the face to prevent wrinkles. Well, okay, estrogen helps wrinkles. It's true, but we know it does. However, estriol is a very weak estrogen. It's about 100 times weaker than estradiol. If you are a woman like your age who has normal estrogen levels, like you're not menopausal, estriol is going to do absolutely nothing because you already have estradiol in your skin, which is 100 times stronger but they're not saying that in the ad, they're just marketing to women that helps wrinkles. So what are women gonna do? They're buying it like crazy. And they don't, the ingredients, if you ever go on a website and you can't find the ingredients or it takes you like 10 minutes to find the ingredients, don't buy it. I'm also not a fan of proprietary blends that have like 47 things in them. I'm more of a purist. If you're gonna use magnesium, just use magnesium. You don't need 12 other things. So. Unfortunately, I think, yes, the supplement industry realizes that people, here's the other thing. There's another product out there. I won't name it, but they'll even say in their ads, you won't notice the difference for 12 months. Okay. Well, that means you got to buy their product for 12 months and they have a 30 day money back guarantee. But if you got to use it for a year, you can't return it. So it's like, 
come on. And cer- certainly people can see through that, but I don't think they do. I think a lot of people still buy it. Well, a lot of these ads, like they play on people's emotions and mm-hmm. their insecurities. It, of and their, oh, God. It's, I, I spend a lot of my time like going through supplements with people. Like they'll like, what do you think of this supplement and that supplement? Like I will sit there like yeah. literally going through like the website of like looking all the, it's all the stuff. Well, anybody that's there. done any marketing knows you have to hit the pain points, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And so what are the pain points still? It's going to be insomnia, weight gain, you know, hot flashes. Um, for women, most of the time they're going to talk about weight gain. They're going to talk about sleep. And and some of these products may actually work. Like I was talking with a, a lady on Instagram yesterday and she said this product, wild yam cream, that's a big one. Wild yam cream is a complete scam because, and this is the marketing, the yam, which is the sweet potato, the yam has a chemical in it called Dioscoria that is what we make progesterone from. Great. The yam cream companies are taking that and they're saying it's just as good as progesterone. The problem is, the Dioscoria, you can't physically change that in your body. It's You don't have the chemical reactions to do it. And Dioscoria doesn't do anything. So they take the Dioscoria in a lab and they make progesterone out of it, but your body can't do that. So it's a total waste of money. So I had a lady on there yesterday and she said, well, I put the cream on, it made me feel better. And my response was placebo is an amazing thing because 60% of, we even know this about Prozac for goodness sakes, 60% of the result is placebo. and so you'll keep buying it. And some people do feel better. It doesn't mean it's doing anything, but so, and, and, and I guess the point of that too is, is as long as you're okay with it and you're not spending your last dollar on this stuff, I just like people to have the truth. If you still want to buy it, that's your choice. But just know that like with those wild yam creams, it's not going to do anything. And most people don't get a result. Some will, and they can keep buying it, but I just like it to be more truthful. But then the companies would never be able to market anything if they said it doesn't actually work. So obviously yeah. it's, it's like it doesn't actually work, but we're going to talk yeah. to you about We're you hoping know, the placebo, yeah. you'll still buy it. Yes. <laughs> but you're, the placebo, I mean, it's like best case scenario, right? It's like yeah. you, you do nothing, you get a result. That's like the beautiful thing. Yeah. But, um, you know, I thank you for sharing that because supplements, that's a question that comes up so, so much in my field. Now I want to shift gears for a moment, you know, because we were talking earlier about, you know, the wounded healer aspect for, um, you know, for in terms of healthcare providers. And I always ask people who are also in the healthcare field, you know, because it can be a really, like, it can drain you, it can deplete you, it can really knock you on your ass. But, mm-hmm. um, for, you know, so for you, what are some, would you say some of your own self-care, like non-negotiables are things that help you, you know, be able to do the work that you do? For me? Or do I tell patients? I'm not thinking about for you, but if you prefer, Um, we can. You know, like I was talking before we got on the air, I am a living hypocrisy. I I recently lost 40 pounds, but, and that was because I I finally got to the point where I I felt like I, I, I am a hypocrisy. I'm not, I'm telling people how to take care of themselves and I'm not taking care of me. But I would say, and I'm a work in progress, but I would say the first thing that you need to do or that, and that I need to do is eat right. It's okay to treat yourself, but you know, I'm not a buyer. I'm not somebody that buys into carnivore or veganism. I think that we have evolved to the point where, you know, a good balance, you know, good, you know, healthy lean meats and vegetables and fruits. Try to stay away from processed carbs. Sleep is another one. Sleep is super important. And again, I was a great sleeper throughout most of my life. And now I got divorced, I think is what happened. I couldn't sleep after my divorce. I don't know if it was just being alone. Um, and you know, I'm used to having like four kids in the house and was married and, and, and then I was all of a sudden by myself, but I'm working on that. For me personally, something that is a non-negotiable right now is getting acupuncture once a week. I don't know why it works. It just does. I mean, I, I, and I, I, like I said, it's like, I don't even care. I'd like the placebo. If it's placebo, I don't care because I think it works for me. But I always tell women too, and this is something recent. I used to think that cold plunging stuff was just like a fad or whatever. I've done it a few times. It does help me feel better. I mean, as much as it pains me to get in that water. So I always tell people you can do that in the shower, you know, you just 
put your shower on super cold and stand there as long as you can hack it. And I have an infrared sauna that I try to do daily too. If nothing else, I just feel like I like the heat and I like the sweat. And then the other thing I try to do religiously, but not great at it is um, either go to hot yoga. When I do hot yoga three to four times a week, I just feel better. I just feel like I've often joked like you could hit me with a piece of wood and I wouldn't care. It's just a very relaxing thing. Or, and I know this is controversial, or get chiropractic if I can't get to the yoga person. I, I don't know what it is. It's just there's something about giving yourself over to another process and just kind of letting go. I'm reading a book right now called Outrageous Openness that somebody recommended. And it's just being open to the possibilities that I'm a worrier. I'm, you know, we talked about astrology. I'm a Virgo kind of person and I overthink everything and I worry about everything. And when you own your own business, that's just horrible because you, you know, there's never enough and blah, blah, blah. But if I just realize that it's like a wave and it comes and it goes and it comes and it goes that I, if I could just surrender to that process for me, that's part of it. But I, I, I felt my best when I was doing my, um, PhD work for those six years, because I was delving deep into shamanism and the what what could possibly be outside of what we can see. And it might sound crazy to some people, but for me, it was just, wow, the possibilities are endless. And then I got out of it in 2015 and struggled. And now I'm kind of getting back into neuro-linguistic programming and talking how you talk. And if you say to yourself, you're fat, that your body's going to hear that. There's the number one book sale in the last few years is The Body Keep Score. Because you do, traumas stay with you. And Trying to work on all of that, I think for me is probably the best thing that I can do for myself is being more self-aware. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think there is this misconception that healthcare providers like somehow are like perfect, you know, like. I'm far from perfect. Right. Like, and I say when I was writing my second book, The Farewell Tour, which literally sleep is in the title, like better sleep is in the title. I had had, I had never had worse insomnia. And for me, a lot of it was trauma response, so like being physically in a place where I had history of trauma occurrence. So my nervous system was like, we cannot handle this. And I was up in the middle of the night for months and months and months. It was horrible. And I felt like such a fraud because here I am writing this book where there's an entire section to help people sleep better. And I was having the worst sleep of my life. And it was a, you know, it's a learning experience, but it was, yeah. um, I remember that it was you no, know, was a, I, def, I definitely had instances of like where I'd be counseling my patients on sleep. And I was like, well, you know, they're, that, they're I'm not doing what I should be doing, you know, but I'm going to tell them what they should do. <laughs> like we all have our version of certain mm -hmm. things. And we are, I, I like to think that we're all, all works, always works in progress, you know, in different areas. I, I mean, I grew up, my mom talked to me about like Louise Hay and, oh, yeah. uh, you know, the kind of being very aware as well about like the law of attraction and, remember listening to Abraham Hicks CDs in the oh, yeah. car. Like, yes. so I grew up with all that stuff kind of being just very normal. And like, this is, this is how we do things. So I'd love listening to Abraham Hicks. I just can't stand the accent that she yes. has. So it yes. drives me, it drives me nuts. But the message, I don't mind. Yeah. I still get the daily newsletters because it's like the message without the accent. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. But I, you know, that awareness of thoughts, that self-awareness, you know, even when things are really challenging or I'm having a phase where I'm struggling with something, you know, it is really that that self-awareness can be really helpful just to kind of be like, okay, we're going to get we're going to get through this. These are the things that are, you know, we're working on right now. But I appreciate you sharing that. And thank you for sharing about the cold plunge as well. I have not tried it. And part of me is afraid that I'm going to like it and then like want to talk about it all the time. Well, that's exactly what I did. I, I got in and then I got out and I wanted to go buy one because it just felt good. And I, that was probably the best night's sleep I'd had in years. And uh, I don't know. I mean, there is something about all the cold shock proteins and stuff like that. So, it, you know, I'm sure it does something. You know, the athletes have been using that kind of stuff for decades. You know, you see them sit in those ice baths after the game and whatnot. So we know it does work. But I just kind of felt like because it got adopted by that kind of fringy, you know, group that, you know, the the I call them the the 20 to 35 year olds that have like inordinate amount of money and they just can go to the Amazon and do ayahuasca and, you know, that group. And it just, it's like, whenever it gets adopted by that group, I'm like, oh, it's like, 
It's like the Antichrist. And, and, but uh, on that, and that's unfortunate because I probably shouldn't be like that. But, you know. No, it's hard not to. I, I, I call them the biohacker bros. Yeah, yeah. It's just like that, yeah. like that vibe. It's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, and I, I, I live in Austin where Aubrey Marcus is. And Aubrey, is a, he's a nice guy. I've met him a couple of times. He's just got, he's got a ton of money and he's formed that, you know, workout group on it with Rogan and, and, you know, and he's, you know, he's, I think he's got a lot of good information, but whenever he adopts something, it tends to be a little, everybody jumps on it because it's Aubrey Marcus and it's like, they don't even know what they're doing, <laughs> but, but if he says, it's okay, well then it's like the Burning Man crowd, you know, it's yeah. like. Yeah. Burning Man, when it first started was for beatnik people that had no money, they would go out. Now it costs like, I got invited and it was like $15,000 to go. Oh. And I was like, when did it turn into this super, because you got to rent an RV, you got to bring in all your food, you got the lot fees. And I mean, and it's people that just are bored, I think. They're just yeah. bored. And I know I'm probably going to get a lot of blowback for this, but not overall. I mean, not everybody, but you know, it's just, it's like, so whenever it happens, comes out of that crowd, I kind of feel like, and maybe I'm, that's, that's one of my things I need to work on. I get that immediate kind of guttural reaction, you know, and, but there is some good information there. I think that I obviously am finding out on my own. Yeah. Now, something I like to ask everyone who comes on this podcast, like just, you know, for people who want to learn more about your work, check out your book, where can they do so? So the book, The Hormone Balance Bible, I wrote, it came out in 2021, HarperCollins. It basically describes the top 12 hormonal archetypes. And by archetypes, I mean like testosterone deficiency, I call it the nun. Low thyroid is the underdog. And I put them into archetypes because they tell stories. So it makes it a little easier to comprehend. I like talking in narrative and stories. So that's why I did that. If you are, if you don't have the book and you want to go to tassonmd.com backslash quiz, I have a 36 question quiz. It's pretty involved and it's got, I've mathematically weighted it on the back end. It will give you the top archetype based on how you answer those questions. Now, nothing is as good as having your labs checked, obviously, but it gives you a place to start at midnight when you're awake because you're an insomniac and you don't know what's going on. So tassonmd.com uh, backslash quiz. I'm on Instagram, Sean Tess on MD. I'm always putting out reels every day and try to make it funny. That's part of my personality, like top five things I found in vaginas kind of stuff. But, um, but I also try to teach at the same time. And then obviously I'm licensed in 23 states, so I can see people one-on-one -on -one through Zoom. And if you're struggling and you're out there and nobody's listening to you, that's what I do. Amazing. We'll be sure to link to all that in the show notes. So Thanks. Can connect with you. Okay, so thank you for coming on the show today. I have one more question for you. Sure. I know I gave you a heads up, but this is a yep. question I ask everyone who comes on there. And I just, I like that there's so many different ways to interpret this and it's constantly evolving, I think, for all of us. But today, at this moment in time, what does healthy living mean to you? It's a good question because, as I said earlier, I'm a uh, living hypocrisy. I have high blood pressure and I'm currently on three medications and it's still high. And it's a little bit scary at 56. And I have no reason to have it. Um, everything's normal. It has to be stress. It has to be me worrying about things. And so it's interesting you asked me that question because I have been kind of struggling now. And the thing for me that is imperative right now is exercise. I haven't been exercising. So healthy living for me means I need to move my butt. And I have absolutely no doubt because I've lost 40 pounds so that I can um, bring my blood pressure down. But I got caught up in the business. I got caught up in, you know, growing and scalability and blah, blah, blah. And I forgot about myself. And so for me, I think healthy living means I need to refocus 2024 and understand that to focus on me isn't self-centered. It's not egotism. I've got four kids and I want to be around for a while. And um, I think so for me, yeah, one is being worthy. That's another thing I'm working on is that I am worthy to be healthy and to have the life that I want. So being worthy and um, moving my butt a little bit more are probably what I'm going to focus on. I love it. Thank you for sharing. Sure. For all of you guys who are out there listening to this podcast episode, thank you as always for your time, your energy. If you like what you hear, please consider leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. They do matter and help me to continue to bring you guests like Sean to some. And 
All right, guys, it has been a joy being with all of you today. Have a wonderful day and we'll talk soon. Thank you for listening to Drama-Free Healthy Living with Jess Cording. We'll see you next time.